Welcome to the latest episode of the Hunter Baumgart Sports Podcast. My name is Hunter Baumgart, your host. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Hunter B on Air. Feel free to like the Facebook page as well, Hunter Baumgart Sports. And remember, you can watch or listen to the podcast. You can watch on YouTube or listen on SoundCloud. Simply search Hunter Baumgart Sports Podcast. Today, I'm really excited for this interview. We have Lisa Salters, who is works for ESPN. Of course, you see her as the sideline reporter for Monday Night Football every Monday night, but also uh, the NBA on ABC and ESPN. And of course, she's done college football in the past and also had um, a lot of time in news as well before she transferred over to sports. So we are going to cover all of that today uh, in this episode of the Hunter Baumgart Sports Podcast. I'm going to a- ask her about, of course, covering Monday Night Football, maybe some of the relationships relationships she's built there also she was at the game Packers fans that uh, the fail Mary the Seahawks and the Packers uh, she was covering Monday Night Football at that time uh, the sideline reporter of course so she was there did a post game interview I'm going to ask her about that she also covered the OJ Simpson trials in her time at at ABC on the news side so we are going to uh, I'm going to ask her about that we'll discuss that as well and a bunch of other things with Lisa Salters really a pleasure to talk to her today and that's what we we are going to do right now. So with no further ado, here's Lisa Salters. Joining me this week on the Hunter Baumgart Sports Podcast is Lisa Salters. You recognize her from ESPN's Monday Night Football and also the NBA on ESPN and ABC and many other roles with ESPN and ABC over the years. And uh, you can follow her on Twitter at Salters L. And Lisa, really appreciate the time uh, this morning to chat a little bit about your career. And I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Nice so, to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you as well. And um, obviously watched you over the years and admire your work, you know, as a as a broadcast professional myself just graduated college uh, last year. It's it's, um, you know, inspiring to talk to people who who are so good at what they do. So I just wanted to say that to you as we start here. I wanted to um, first I know you 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 were, um, you know, you were in news before you were in sports. Were you did, was sports something that you always knew you wanted to do or did you want to do news and then kind of fell into sports? How was that deciding between, okay, I, I want to eventually get to sports or do I want to stay in news? What was kind of yeah. your dream? Yeah. Um, it wasn't to be in sports. <laughs> that wasn't okay. even a, it wasn't even something that I considered. Okay. Um, you know, I knew I wanted to be a journalist and uh, to me, all I knew was news Okay. Um, so I didn't really know they, that journalists did sports, <laughs> so, yeah. you know, I, you know, I went to school and, um, uh, majored in broadcast journalism at Penn state mm. and, uh, graduated and got a job at a, a, a local television station in Baltimore. Sure. And, um, I did that for seven years and then, um, hired an agent and I got some interviews, bigger, bigger better places and I don't know about better but bigger places and Mm -hmm. uh, ended up uh, pretty quickly uh, at the network so I was with ABC uh, based and they based me in Los Angeles so that's how I got out west Uh, so I covered the OJ Simpson trials one and two uh, criminal and civil and um, because I was based out there in LA I uh, my bureau chief there his father happened to be an executive uh, in at ESPN and oh. so he kept asking, hey, would Lisa want to come over to, to ESPN? And I kept saying, no, why would I leave network news to right. go do sports? That's just silly. Like, uh, you know, back then when you're in journalism, network news is considered to be the, you know, the top, mm-hmm. uh, the epitome of broadcast journalism. And um, eventually, as I became more and more unfulfilled and unsatisfied with mm. network news, it just kind of was boring to me. I wasn't Mm. passionate about it. It wasn't really my thing. I enjoyed local news more than I did network news. Uh, You're fighting all these correspondents fighting for a little bit of airtime every day. Uh, So eventually I said, okay, I'll, you know, I'll give sports a try. And since ESPN and ABC are both owned by Disney, it was like making a lateral move within the, just going to a different part of the Mm. company. Uh, And I said, if I don't like it, I can come back to ABC. Yeah. And they, they said yes. And uh, I wish I had made the move sooner because, uh, mm. you know, once I left and started covering sports and seeing all the different um, avenues that were open and the different opportunities that were out there uh, and how exciting it is. And in a lot of ways, I was telling many of the same stories that I would tell in news, but they were just mm-hmm. about athletes or, or about yeah. sports. 
Uh, so, you know, that's how I made the transition. It's, and, you know, now I've been doing sports longer than I was doing news. I've been doing sports now for 20 years and I did news mm. for 12. Gotcha. That makes, that makes sense. And I wanted to ask you, you brought up the OJ Simpson trials. What was it like to cover that? What was your role covering that with ABC? And then what was that like to cover, you know, such a high profile event like that, that we all know about? Well, at the time, you know, I didn't realize that it was going to be such an historic uh, yeah. event. Um, it was just my ass assignment. It was just what I was, I went to do every day. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so I'd get up every day, go to court um, and file reports about that day that day's events in courts in in court and i was uh the uh i was the news one correspondent for abc that's the affiliate correspondent so um all of the abc affiliates around the country i was their oj simpson person so that every, okay. all of those i mean everybody wanted the story mm -hmm. but not all of the markets could afford to send you know a person to los angeles and have them there for a year mm -hmm. uh so i was that person and so I would do live shots for, uh, for news outlets around the country all day long mm. um, about that day's events in the courtroom. And the next day, uh, you know, I would listen to the trial and file reports about that day's, uh, that day's events. So um, it was, I, I, I can't, I don't even know how many live shots. I, I, I would say hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of live shots just wow on the OJ Simpson case alone for various news outlets around the country. The big, the big and the small, Chicago, New York, um, Miami, uh, but all the small, the small, small places too. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's covering such a high profile event like that. And so I want to, you know, go into a little bit of your uh, sports career and talk a little bit about your covering some worldwide events, including the world cup and the Olympic games. What is a favorite memory or two from covering, you know, those big worldwide sporting events rather than, you know, something in the United States, like, you know, like a football game or like a basketball game. What is it like to go on that world stage and cover the Olympics or cover the world cup? Yeah, when you cover an event like that, an international event, mm -hmm. you really get that international feel, uh, especially for the Olympics. So many nations, so many fans from all over the world are in, are in one spot, um, mm -hmm. kind of celebrating sports, their team, um, that event, uh, their country. And um, it really is cool to be a part of that. In Korea, especially for the, for the World Cup in, uh, I guess it was 20, 2002, mm. um, it was just so much fun. I spent six weeks in Korea okay. and the Korean national team, um, you know, started upsetting people. So they did, mm. you know, they kind of overachieved in, in those Olympics. They were the hometown team, nation. Sure. And they just were winning matches that no one thought that they were going to win. And every time they won, like all of Seoul, Korea, would just shut down and people would be like cruising through the streets and blaring the horns and, um, you know, like these makeshift parades every, every time after a win. Like mm -hmm. imagine after what happens after um, a team wins, like, uh, I don't know. The, the Lakers win or the yeah. Dodgers win. Like people go out mm -hmm. in the streets and start celebrating. Right. So that's what it was every gotcha. time they'd win. And they were playing wow. like every four or five days. And I was out there celebrating and, you know, mm -hmm. with everybody else. Yeah, right. And finally it got to a point that I was like, and I was covering the United States team mostly, mm. uh, but I was caught up in this, in, in just the fever of what the, Korean national team was doing and it got to a point after a couple of weeks in I was like these guys have to lose because I got to get some sleep uh, I'm yeah, right. tired from being out celebrating with it with these these folks all night um, but uh, that was just so much fun to to be to to learn about the Korean culture mm -hmm. um, the Korean food was amazing um, and uh, that was just one of my better international moments Sure. Not just the sports aspect, but just the culture of being in another sure. country and, and covering exactly. something like that. Exactly. That is uh, Lisa Salters joining me on the Hunter Baumgart Sports Podcast. You uh, see her on ESPN's Monday Night Football uh, and, of course, uh, the NBA on ESPN and ABC. So you became the sideline reporter for Monday Night Football in 2012. Of course, you've done countless NBA games as well in college football. So you've done, obviously, many interviews, countless interviews after games. So 
what what is like the rush like when a player you know makes a game winning shot or makes a last second field goal or something happens right near the end of the game and you have to kind of make the questions up on the spot react in the moment and then run out onto the field and ask these you know the player who just made the play or something like that what is what is that feeling like and and how do those situations go well i think those are the easiest situations mm. uh, when something monumental happens right at the end of the game mm -hmm. that makes the questioning so much easier because you, yeah. you just focus on that one thing that happened yeah. that one event um you know what was your mindset before it happened what were you thinking when the play call came in mm -hmm. what were you know what were you thinking as the ball left your hand uh you know things like that and so that makes it's pretty easy you're just kind of like a person walking up to somebody like oh my gosh tell me about what just happened yeah um most interviews are not like that. It's a, they're about like they, they, they encompass the whole span of the game. Mm -hmm. And so you're trying to pick out parts of the game that you think will be uh, are the most uh, interesting to the fan back at home. Um, I'm just kind of taking, for example, the, this week's game of the Rams and the Bears. Mm. Uh, we interviewed Aaron Donald post game. Mm -hmm. So there was no end of late game buzzer beating, um, you know, uh, event that happened mm -hmm. or a play that happened. So, you know, I just kind of wanted to take him through, you know, uh, the game for us, the, that post-game interview is to me the stamp at the end of a week's worth of preparation. Mm. So, you know, all week long, we, you know, Aaron Donald had been saying that he thought that his team was, had played soft the week mm. before against the 49ers. So, you know, you kind of want to put a bow on, on that game and on the week's week of preparation so my first mm. question to him was you thought that you guys were soft last week how would you describe and you know you don't want to say did you think you were soft this week that's <laughs> right. a yes no question it's like you just describe how how would you describe your performance this week yeah um and so you let him go in into that and he had talked to you know again this is not just we're not just you know we don't just show up and do the game and then mm. ask questions about the game we've had uh, you know interviews throughout the week with these players so we've gotten their thoughts on how they think the game is going to go he had said you know we were soft last week we want to be physical aggressive and dominant uh mm -hmm. this week and so i asked them about that um about especially how you know it was very obvious that chicago wanted to run the ball like mm -hmm. they they have a struggling offense so they need to establish the run uh, they ended up, I think, with 49 rushing yards. So they were right. not able to establish the run because yeah. you know, the, the Aaron Donald Rams defense shut that down. Um, so um, generally, we're interviewing a quarterback after a game um, mm -hmm. or an offensive player. So it was uh, it was nice to be able to you know interview uh, Aaron Donald because he is such an impactful player, and uh, the defense, mm -hmm. you know, even though the score was I'm trying to think what the score was, 35 to 10, maybe something yeah, like that. Yeah, 24 to 10, uh, Even something the like score that. really was, there were a lot of points put on the board by mm -hmm. the Rams. By the Rams, It really was a defensive game. The defense mm -hmm. put, put its stamp on that game. Exactly. And I do want to ask you about another specific Monday night game. Uh, if you do remember, I think it was, it, it might have been your, uh, in 2012, one of your first years with Monday night football, of course, being in Wisconsin, I wanted to ask you about this as um, Packer, Packers fans might be interested. The, the Packers, yes, the fail Mary, the one. Yeah. And I, and you did cover that game, correct? For ESPN? Yes. Yeah, okay, that's that's what I thought. What was that like at the end? Um, if I if I remember right, I think you interviewed Golden Tate afterwards. But what was what was that like? And what did you see when the refs one ref says no, one ref says yes? Well, I was just as confused as everybody else. I mean, to me, it looked like he. To me, it looked like. Uh, it looked like an interception to me. Mm -hmm. So, um, but but at that you know at that point, I'm just. You know, I'm ready to go home. So it's yeah, like right. I don't care what the call is, just make the call so we can go. <laughs> uh, and and then when to to have um, to to have Golden Tate afterwards, and I mean usually I I'm, I don't ask yes no questions, but sometimes you just have to get to the point. Right. To yeah. Push off. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> so um, that was pretty funny, but. Mm -hmm. um, 
Yeah, I, I'm trying to go back to to remember the play. To, yeah. I, I think that my initial reaction was that it was an interception. I don't, sure. I don't know what you thought it was. Right. But, Were you uh, on for, the uh, for Packers fans? Yeah. Um, I guess that was uh, that, and that was in Seattle too, right? Yes, it was in Seattle. Yes, it was yeah. in Seattle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. To me, it looked like it, an interception, but you know, uh, didn't they get the, that referee situation fixed shortly after that? Yes. Yes, I think by absolutely. the time the next week came, the, the, <laughs> the uh, regular officials were back on the field. Exactly, exactly. I wanted to ask you about that because I know Packers fans are still not too happy. And then the 2014 NFC Championship game for Packers fans against Seattle is still, you know, everything just keeps adding on to it. But what, were there any other games that you've covered that you, like off the top of your head, kind of wild finishes um, that you still kind of can't believe happened or you had to do an interview after? Oh, oh, I mean, there have been some really great ones. Every game that we have with Drew Brees, it seems like he yeah. uh, has done something ridiculous um, and historic. Mm-hmm. Uh, the game last year, the the Rams and the uh, and the uh, the Ravens. Mm. Um, I mean, <laughs> Lamar Jackson, the five touchdowns. Yeah, uh, that was that was pretty cool. Um, let me see. Oh, the uh, the charge or the um, the Chiefs was it the Chiefs and the Rams? The yeah, year the, that? the yeah the high scoring. I mean one. that it was, and I think that the Chiefs had gone down early in that game. Mm-hmm. And I thought, oh my gosh, it's going to be a blowout, and then it just ended up being a slugfest. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, yeah, had some pretty memorable games. So Lisa Salter is joining me on the Hunter Baumgart Sports Podcast. I wanted to ask you about, I believe you covered the Super Bowl for the first time. Was it last year? Were you at the, was yes. that the first one? Okay. So you were covering for ESPN's broadcast, I read, in Australia and New Zealand. What, what was that like and what does that entail and how was it covering the Super Bowl? Uh, well, the Super Bowl itself, um, you know, such a huge event. I'm used to being mm-hmm. doing basketball by then and having a basketball game yeah. that Saturday. Um, and, and then hosting a Super Bowl party at my house for my friends. So <laughs> sure. I was disappointed that I wasn't able to continue the tradition of having uh, a Super Bowl party. Uh, but the Super Bowl itself, it was, it was challenging, I would say, because, mm. because it's not um, uh, ESPN doesn't have the rights for the Super Bowl, nor mm. does ESPN Australia. So you're kind of relegated for me as a sideline person, as a sideline person, in one spot on the field. I couldn't mm. leave like this box. Uh, so I couldn't roam the field like I normally do. Mm-hmm. Um, this year with COVID, it probably would be the same anyway. <laughs> yeah, right. So it's basically what I'm doing now. It's yeah. just, you know, in one spot, w- watching the game go on down below me. Um, but uh, it was challenging in, in that aspect. Uh, but it was also, uh, you know, it was the Super Bowl. So mm-hmm. it was cool to be there for that, especially, you know, for Andy Reid to win his first championship. Mm-hmm. Um, I've become friends with with Travis Kelsey and his family mm-hmm. so it was that was that was uh that was nice to be there when he you know when he got got his championship um but then I'm also friends with Robbie Gold and mm-hmm. so I was really hurting for him yeah um, you know fellow Penn Stater that he yes. uh that he was not able to you know get uh get that championship so um I know you're just starting out in your career, mm-hmm. Hunter, but you'll come yeah. to find out when you're like 5, 10, 15 years down the road, mm-hmm. I'm now 32 years down the road, that so much of what we do now, what you remember, what's important to you are the relationships. Mm-hmm. Um, so kind of the games and the scores, uh, I am, I must admit, I don't necessarily remember right. all of them, um, but the people and their stories mm. and, um, you know, it's the relationships that uh, that I, I remember. And so I, I find myself rooting for people and mm-hmm. certain players because I've gotten to know their families or the coaches' families or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was definitely cool to be there for the Super Bowl. I don't know if it's going to happen again this year, of course. Right. Um, but if not, then the Salters Super Bowl party will be back on. <laughs> yes, exactly. And I was my final question was asking, actually going to be about those relationships and just whether it's people you've worked with at ESPN, working with games, or maybe players, like you said, Travis Kelsey, what are some of the relationships you've built with, whether it be players or whether it be um, fellow media members at ESPN that, that, that you cherish over the years? Um, just, you know, the, 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 the friendships, the people yeah. who are, 
always there to, to help you if you need something, mm -hmm. um, especially the women, because so much mm -hmm. it's often said that, you know, that we women don't stick together. Um, mm -hmm. Well, like we like men, like not all men like each other, not all women like each other, <laughs> but that we there are some that we, you know, that we're very close. Hannah mm -hmm. Storm, Susie Colbert, Pam mm -hmm. Oliver, um, you know, Michelle Tafoya, Maria Taylor, mm -hmm. um, you know, and I, I think as women, we kind of tend to look out for each other a little bit more. Sure. Uh, because we know that people kind of are scrutinizing us and, mm -hmm. and are critical of us a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that, um, you know, the, the relationships and the professional relationships and the personal ones mm -hmm. that I've uh, been able to establish throughout my career, um, not just with my colleagues, but also with, with players, with coaches, um, mm -hmm. you know, that, again, the, the, that's the most important uh, that's what I will take with me once I, yeah. I eventually retire. Exactly. Lisa Salter is joining me right here on the Hunter Baumgart Sports Podcast. Lisa, really appreciate you squeezing me into your busy schedule preparing for another Monday night game. Uh, this coming Monday night, we've got the Buccaneers and the Giants, correct? That's right. Sounds good. So that'll be on ESPN on Monday night. You can see Lisa there. Lisa, Thank you so much again and um, have fun the rest of the week preparing for that game. And uh, it was great to talk to you. My pleasure. Nice meeting you. That is Lisa Salters, ESPN Monday Night Football sideline reporter. Also, uh, covers the NBA on ESPN and ABC as their reporter as well. And done some college football in the past. We talked about the Super Bowl. She's been all over the sports world and, of course, the news world. It was interesting to hear about what it was like you know, covering the uh, O.J. Simpson trials as well. So really appreciate Lisa Selters uh, fitting me in in her busy schedule. I know she's preparing for the, um, the Buccaneers and the Giants coming up on Monday night, so she's got a full plate. So really appreciate uh, her time, and it was a pleasure to talk to someone so established in the industry and also just absolutely so good at what she does and um you know i said that during the interview but i i truly believe it you know once you know you get so many years under your belt that it's just so polished and just so good the interview questions at the end of games i highly suggest you know watching next monday night as the buccaneers take on the giants and you know watching your post game uh you know questions because they're just so good so it was a pleasure to talk to lisa and i hope you enjoyed it as much as i I will talk to you coming up next week again on the Hunter Baumgart Sports Podcast. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Hunter B on Air. Feel free to like the Facebook page as well, Hunter Baumgart Sports. And you can watch or listen to the podcast. You can watch on YouTube or listen on SoundCloud. Simply search Hunter Baumgart Sports Podcast. Thanks again to Lisa Selters. Have a great rest of your week. And as always, stay positive. <laughs>